In the last lecture, we started to talk about the Carnot cycle. And like most other cycles, the Carnot cycle had four steps. Now, the difference between the Carnot cycle and some of the other things that we're going to do moving forward this semester is that you're able to make some simplifying assumptions to the Carnot cycle where you essentially decouple heat transfer from work and they're done in their own distinct steps. And you do that where the Carnot cycle exists of three components. One is your system and then you have uh, two reservoirs and at different times during the Carnot cycle, the reservoir acts as the surroundings, whether it's the hot reservoir or the cold reservoir. And the four steps in the Carnot cycle were, you know, step one was a reversible adiabatic compression. And remember that the Carnot cycle exists between two temperatures and it's the temperatures of the reservoir. So we went from the cold temperature to the hot temperature. Now, if we were to draw this in a way that might feel somewhat familiar to us, the first step in um, the first step in our Carnot cycle, if we were to draw this, I think maybe makes the most sense to you guys um, with a PV diagram. And if we have the pressure here on the y-axis and the specific volume here on the x-axis and we start to draw the Carnot cycle, actually step one, we think of as almost always being the very beginning or the lowest volume in the Carnot cycle, that's not really the case. So step one actually happens from somewhere over here and we're gonna move up from some state there to some state there and that's step one. And then we have step two in the Carnot cycle, which was a reversible isothermal expansion at the hot temperature. And what happens there is that at, at constant temperature, we accept uh, uh, heat from the hot reservoir and we allow the system to expand, right? And the, we had to do that so that way you could maintain a constant temperature. And that's step two. If you remember, step three in our Carnot cycle was a reversible adiabatic expansion. from T hot to T cold. And that looks like this on our PV diagram. And in fact, maybe it'd be better to come down just a little bit, right? That's step three. And then step four is a reversible isothermal compression. at T cold. So step four takes us from down here back up to there, right? And that's step four, okay? And when we met in the last lecture, we said that, well, a PV diagram might be the way that we're used to visualizing changes in the thermodynamic properties of gases. But in this case, there's something that happens that's very interesting. And it's best noticed on a temperature entropy diagram. And in step one, since it's reversible and adiabatic, it's isentropic. And so we're going to start here. And step one, we know that there's an increase of entropy as we go from T hot to T cold. And we know that because delta S over R is equal to the integral of CP over R dT over T. So we know that the entropy has to increase 
when we go to this higher temperature. The second step, this reversible isothermal expansion means that we're going to move to the right here at T hot in step two. And then in step three, when we have this reversible adiabatic expansion, we know again, step three reversible and adiabatic means that it's isentropic. And so we're going to move down here back to T cold. And then the fourth step is a reversible isothermal compression. So at T cold, we're going to move to the left here. And so these are two totally different ways that we can visualize what's happening inside of a Carnot cycle. And we had developed a definition in our last lecture for the efficiency, which was minus the net amount of work divided by QN. And if you remember, in the Carnot cycle, we made a really big deal out of the fact that not only did we decouple the work and heat steps, right? So step one is the work that we put in, right? Step three is the work that we get out, but also the heat steps occur isothermally. And we talked through a little bit of decoupling work and um, heat and then heat and temperature. How those, even though it's counterintuitive, heat and temperature are not always related the same way that we usually think of them. And from here, we were able to derive an expression for the efficiency, right? Where that was equal to one minus T cold over T hot, and of course those temperatures are going to be absolute temperatures. And we did a couple other things in the last lecture as well, where we talked about how the sum of, when you go around a cycle, delta U is equal to zero, but the sum for of all the Qs and all the Ws is not zero because Q and W are not state functions, but the internal energy is, and so is the entropy and so is the enthalpy. So what I wanted to do in our lecture today is apply the equations and the principles from the last lecture in a few example problems that we can hopefully get a better feeling for understanding what's being asked in some of these Carnot engine related problems, how we might be able to use the Carnot cycle in a practical way and then also doing calculations. So for example, it's fine to look at a diagram like the one here in the upper right, but how would we use that information to actually find the efficiency of a cycle or to know everywhere in this diagram, what is the temperature, what is the pressure, et cetera. So that's what I would like to do is just a few examples where we apply the Carnot um, equations in various ways. And hopefully that helps you guys with the homework a little bit. And of course, with your, with your fundamental understanding. So before I do that, and I start to solve a few problems, does anybody have a question that they want to ask? Yeah. You said in step one, the entropy increases or does it stay constant? No, in step one, the entropy is constant. Yeah. I'm sorry. Um, yeah. The temperature goes up. But as you do this compression, remember the pressure also goes up and so it's reversible and adiabatic. So those two will counter each other. So yeah, I apologize if I misspoke there before, but excellent question. All right, great. And that was very good. Um, all right, let's do a couple of example problems and I'm gonna pull up you know, PowerPoint and I'll apply you know, these equations to, um, to a couple of problems that appear in our textbook. And then finally one, um, one that I made up at the end. So the first problem says that a Carnot engine receives 250 kilojoules per second of heat from a heat source reservoir at 525 degrees C and rejects it to a heat sink reservoir at 50 degrees C. What is the power developed and the heat that's rejected. 
So really it's what's the power output and, and how much heat do you remove? And if we look at the diagrams that we drew again, I probably shouldn't even have moved that, that we're given Q in. And from Q in, we're asked to find the power developed, which really is just this term, right? The sum or of the two work steps, right? Or the net amount of work that you're able to extract. And then finally, what is, uh, what is Q out, okay? So actually the best place to start for this problem is this last equation that we've written that the efficiency for the Carnot cycle is one minus T hot over T cold because we're given the hot temperature or the temperature of the hot reservoir here, 525 degrees C. We're also given the temperature of the cold reservoir. So immediately we should be able to calculate the process efficiency or the Carnot efficiency. And so in this example problem, our efficiency is just equal to one minus uh, T cold. So 50 degrees C of course is 323.15 Kelvin divided by the hot temperature of 525 degrees C or 798.15 Kelvin. And from there, we can find that our Carnot efficiency here is 0.5 nine five. And that's important because our definition for efficiency, remember, is minus the net amount of work, which I already wrote above, divided by Q that comes into the process. Well, then if we want to calculate the net amount of work, that's just minus Q in times our efficiency. And in this problem, we're told that we're receiving 250 kilojoules per second. So that's 250 kilojoules per second, right? Or kilowatts times 0 0.595, right? And minus. So the work then is equal to minus 149 kilowatts, right? Or the power that we develop is equal to 149 kilowatts. So knowing the hot and cold temperature and the amount of heat that we were taking in, we could calculate the amount of work that was done by our Carnot cycle. And the last question here is about the heat that is rejected. And for us to answer that question, we have to remember that when we go all around the cycle, the sum of all of the, uh, well, the internal energy is exactly the same being a state function, right? So if we started with our energy balance, right? Delta U is Q plus W. Well, if we were to sum that over the entire cycle, we would get that the change in the internal energy for our cycle, which we know is actually equal to zero, is equal to, the sum of the heat steps plus the sum of the work. And then zero equals then Q in, right? Minus Q out. And of course, Q out is what is rejected plus the net amount of work that's being done, right? Because that's just these two terms. And so that means that Q out just equals Q in plus the net amount of work that, um, that is being done. And so we know that Q out then is equal to 250 kilojoules per second minus 149 kilowatts. And so Q out, right, is equal to, or Q rejected is probably a better way to think about this, is just 101 kilowatts. Okay. And so that's the amount of heat 
that is rejected in the process, okay? All right, any questions about that? Okay, all right, if not, let's do another example. So this is more about applying the things that we know about Carnot. And here it says that an inventor claims to have devised a cyclic engine that exchanges heat with reservoirs at 25 degrees C and 250 degrees C. And this engine produces 0.45 kilojoules of work for every kilojoule of heat extracted from the hot reservoir. Is this claim believable? And if you remember, when we talked about the second law, I like these questions where inventors claim things and you um, either debunk them or prove that they could possibly be telling the truth. And the nice thing here is that all of these simplifying assumptions that go into the Carnot cycle where we decouple the heat and work steps where everything is reversible, it turns out that the Carnot cycle is the maximum possible efficiency you could ever have for any cycle. So if we can calculate the work that's being done in a given cycle or that's being claimed in a given cycle, we should simply be able to just compare that to the Carnot efficiency. And if that number is ever higher than the Carnot efficiency, then that process is not possible. And in this problem, we can actually figure out what that efficiency is. And in the problem here, the claimed efficiency, which remember is still just the work that you're able to do over the heat that you add to the system. Well, they're saying that you're able to produce 0 0.45 kilojoules of work. So that's 0 0.45 kilojoules divided by QN, right? And that's for every kilojoule that is extracted from the hot reservoir. So that gives us a claimed efficiency of 0 0.45. And like I said, in problems like this, we're really just after, does this break the Carnot cycle? And the Carnot efficiency, we talked about just a second ago, and derived in the last lecture, right? That's still one minus T cold over T hot. So that's one minus, and we're at 25 degrees C is the cold reservoir. So that's 298.15 Kelvin divided by the hot temperature, which is 250 degrees C or 523.15 Kelvin. And that's equal to 0.43. And so here, I'll let you guys answer this question then. Is the claim believable? Yes. No. Oh, I would say no. It's higher than the Carnot efficiency. Yeah, that's right. That's right. Um, so this claim is not believable. Right? because they say that that is greater than the Carnot efficiency. But we know that that is not possible. Okay. And for some problems, this is a really good check. Even when you're not asked to find the Carnot efficiency, but you know that for any process, and we'll do a comparison a couple of times as we move through the semester where we have other types of cycles that are a little bit closer to reality and we'll calculate their maximum efficiency. And then we'll calculate the cardinal efficiency and show that the efficiency for the real cycle or the cycle that more accurately mimics reality is less than the cardinal efficiency. Okay. All right, excellent. All right, before I move on, 
Does anybody have a question that they'd like to ask? So just to make sure that I'm understanding, we're just using the Carnot cycle as a reference, similar to how we used uh, the isentropic case as a reference for entropy. Ex exactly. Yeah, okay. exactly. That's the maximum efficiency you could ever get. Just like when we did isentropic for like a turbine, that was 100% efficiency. So for, from a heat engine perspective, sometimes you'll even be asked, or you'll see that people will report their efficiency as a percentage of the Carnot efficiency. Um, so, so yes, that's a pretty good way to look at it, I think, is that the Carnot is the reference. It's just like, it's, even though the process isn't isentropic, um, even though each of the steps isn't isentropic, it, it has the similar flair. So yeah, I like that as a comparison. All right, any other questions? All right, so then let's do, um, let's do an example where we have to do a couple of calculations. And in this example, we're, we're told that the lowest temperature and pressure for a working fluid in a Carnot cycle is standard temperature and pressure, right? Um, which is one atmosphere, 25 degrees C. We also know that the compression ratio is five to one and the maximum pressure for the cycle is 150 atmospheres. So we're asked to find the temperature, pressure, and specific volume for every state of the fluid in the cycle and to calculate the cycle efficiency. So the first thing I wanna do before I start doing calculations is to draw, um, to draw these two pictures again that I think are gonna be helpful for us to look at. So I'm gonna redraw the two here that are on the top right here. And if you can do that in your notes, it might also help you as well. So, all right, we have our TS diagram where if you remember, right, the TS diagram for Carnot is a box, right? From T cold to T hot, okay? And I always like to draw the arrows so I remember which way we're going because later we're gonna do refrigeration and we're gonna go the other way. And I like to remember that that's step one, right? That's step two, that's step three, that's step four. And I'm gonna do the same thing for our PV diagram. And I'm gonna be a little bit more careful this time with how I draw it. All right, so that goes here to here, then here to there, all right? And remember again, that's step one, step two, step three, and step four. Now, um, The other thing that I want us to do is to keep track of where we are in the cycle. And to do that, I'm gonna label, right? So these are steps, we're using numerical values for steps as you go from one thermodynamic state to another one. And I wanna track the states between the steps, right? Or at the beginning and the end of a step. So to do that, I'm actually just gonna call that A, B, C, and D. And I'm gonna label the same thing here and it's A, B, C, and D. And that way I can keep track of what the temperature, pressure, and specific volume are at each one of these cases. And the reason are each one of these places. And the reason I pick this as A, even though it's not before stage one, is that I like to think of um, I like to think of this from a, um, a compression perspective. And so the, the primary compression from the lowest specific volume in the process starts at A, right? So this is like the lowest specific volume, lowest pressure in the process. This is the highest pressure, highest temperature. And I just like to think about it that way. You can label these any way that you prefer, but that just happens to be the way that I prefer it. 
And if that's the case, then the lowest point, right, or the start of the cycle is A. And we know what's going on at A, right? That our temperature is equal to 25 degrees C. We know that the pressure is equal to one atmosphere. And we also can find the specific volume from the ideal gas law because we know that PA VA has to equal R times TA. So VA equals RTA over PA, which equals 0 0.08206 liter atmosphere per mole Kelvin times our temperature, which is 298.15 Kelvin, divided by the pressure, which is 1.0 atmospheres. And so VA equals 24.5 liters per mole, okay? And so that's the temperature, pressure, and specific volume at A. And so A, you know, is kind of, I guess, done, right, in this particular, um, in this particular problem. So now let's just work our way around the cycle. So let's go from A to B, and then we'll go B to C and C to D. And to calculate the states at B, well, we know that there's a compression, right? We're told that the compression ratio is five to one. So that means that the specific volume for B is just equal to one fifth times the specific volume for A, which is one fifth times 24.5 liters per mole. And that's 4.89 liters per mole. The second thing is that if you look at step four in the Carnot cycle, it's isothermal. So we know that the temperature at B is equal to 25 degrees C or 298.15 Kelvin. And so from there, we can calculate the pressure of B or at state B from the ideal gas equation of state, right? That's just RT over V, right? And that's 0 0.08206 liter atmosphere per mole Kelvin times 298.15 and then divided by 4.89 liters per mole. And so from there, we find that the pressure at B is five atmospheres. Okay. All right, so let's keep moving around our cycle. And if we do that, to get to C, right, through step one, it's isentropic, right? We did an adiabatic reversible compression to get us, oops, sorry guys, to get us from B to C. And so because of that, we can use equations that we used before um, in our semester. So we know that to get to state C, that the integral from TB to TC of CP over R, DT over T, minus the natural log of P2 over P1, right, which is, of course, delta S over R, that is equal to zero. And then the integral from TB to TC of CP over R DT over T equals the natural log of P2 over P1. So if we use air in our cycle, 
we know that air is a, a diatomic gas. If we assume that it's simple and ideal, we know the constant pressure heat capacity is seven halves times R. So then that gives us seven halves times the natural log of TC over TB is then equal to, and I apologize guys for mixing up letters and numbers, right? So that's PC over PB, PC over PB equals the natural log of PC over PB. And so then we know, doing it using the same math that we've used before, that the temperature at C is just then equal to the temperature at B times the net or times then PC over PB to the two sevenths, right? And we've done the math to get from here to here multiple times this semester. And so that just equals 298.15 Kelvin times 150 atmospheres, which we were told was the maximum pressure in the cycle in the problem statement over five atmospheres. So that means that TC is equal to 788 Kelvin, okay? And so now we know from the problem statement that PC was 150 atmospheres. And so now again, we can find the specific volume at C, right? So the specific volume at state C is just equal to R times TC over PC, and that equals 0 0.43 liters per mole, all right? Now I'm not gonna do this, um, but you could have gotten here um, a slightly different way, or you could check it by you also could say, look, I know delta S over R also equals the integral from T1 to T2 of CV over R dT over T plus the natural log of V2 over V1. And you actually could check this. If you insert the numbers that we have just calculated into here and here, you would also get that that's equal to zero. And that's just a check. You know, we don't use that form very often because we do a lot of problems based on temperature and pressure, not temperature and the specific volume, but that's a good check as well. All right, so last, right? So we've determined the physical state here, here, and here. So let's do D. And the way that I like to do it is instead of going from C to D, I'm just gonna do the same math we just did, right? And go from D to A, because we, we know that delta S is equal to zero there as well. So that means that we can use the, the same math that we just did a second ago, right? And that the pressure of D is just the pressure at A times the temperature at D over the temperature at A Um, to the seven halves. And doing that, well, we know that the temperature at D, um, we know the temperature at D because we know C to D is isothermal. So TD is also just equal to 788K, right? And we know TA is 298.15. So from there, right, we can find that PD in this example is 30 atmospheres. And we also can find that the specific volume at D is equal to 2.15 liters per mole from the ideal gas law. Now, something that I think is interesting to point out is that if you look at the way we did the calculations and you were to draw the PV diagram to scale, right? So if we actually did this to scale, um, you actually would find that A is all the way out here. You know, B is here, C is here, and D is about here. So the actual 
cycle itself looks like this. Right, where that's A, B, C, and D. You're not asked for that. It's just, you know, diagrams like this one, we think we know what's going on, but we don't always get to the exact scale that we thought we were going to. Um, and the last thing that we can do here is calculate the efficiency, right? So that's then one minus T cold over T hot. And again, that's one minus. 298.15 Kelvin over, and then we knew that the hot temperature was equal to 788 Kelvin. And so the efficiency of our Carnot cycle is equal to 0 0.62. Okay. Um, does anybody have questions? I'd like to, before we yap about anything else, just open it up to you guys to ask any questions that you might have about any of the three problems that we just did. So the problem statement there didn't state that it was an ideal gas. Do we just assume that for a Carnot cycle? Yeah, yeah. I mean, okay. if, if you're gonna go about assuming everything else is ideal, that's a reasonable, that's a reasonable assumption. Now you could do, um, you could do Carnot cycles with steam. That is possible. Um, and, and, and you would be told, but yeah, I mean, using, you know, air as a working fluid in a Carnot cycle to start off with is pretty common. Good question. All right. Anybody else? All right. Good. Hopefully the calculations that we did here feel pretty typical at this point in the semester. And one of the things that you'll have the opportunity to do in the homework is apply exactly what we just did to different types of problems. And even the equations and the approach to the first two problems you'll find is pretty common in the homework problems as well for, um, for Carnot. So, all right, good. If you guys don't have any other questions, there's just one other point that I wanna bring up. And to do that, I wanna show you guys a a diagram that gets released every year by Lawrence Livermore National Lab. And to me, this really drives home the point of why we spend so much time talking about efficiency. And, you know, every year in the United States, we use about 100 quadrillion BTUs of energy. It's a huge number. It's, it's almost incomprehensible. And we use that to do all sorts of things, you know, whether we want to uh, generate electricity, what, whether we want to enable chemical transformations, um, whether we want to, to, to move from one place to another. And what this does is on the left-hand side, it adds up the primary source for, um, for all of these, I guess it adds up the amount of energy used by each primary energy source, whether we want to talk about oil, natural gas, biomass, um, wind, hydroelectric, nuclear, solar, geothermal. And it starts to break it up into whether we use it for electricity generation or whether that goes towards residential applications, commercial applications, industrial applications, or transportation. And of course, you can see things like petroleum goes overwhelmingly to transportation and um, an enormous amount of the generated electricity, whether it's from natural gas, coal, or the renewables, goes um, to residential, commercial, and some to industrial. But to me, you know, this plot's really interesting. If you ever want to sit and really look at this, you could probably spend a good half hour just looking at this. But the light gray color is the fraction of the 100 quadrillion BTUs that just becomes heat in the end. And the dark gray at the right-hand side is usable energy. 
And so one of the things that you can see is that, well, if we use about 100 quadrillion BTUs, it's almost exactly 100. If you only get 32, maybe we'll call it 33 to be nice, um, quads of usable energy out, that means that the efficiency or the overall conversion efficiency in the energy sector in the United States is less than 33%. And you know, we talk a lot about things like reducing emissions. We talk a lot about transitioning from existing energy sources to alternative energy sources. But one of the biggest ways that you can impact this plot at the same time we continue to develop technologies on the upper left-hand part of this figure is to find ways to improve efficiency.